We're streaming over. And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am thrilled to host today the incredible Helen Cooper, whose brand new red hot book, The Downstairs Neighbor, is out today. Helen, welcome <laughs> to Mighty Mysteries. Tell us about your book. Thank you very much. It's really lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so the book is set in suburban London um, and it's three families sharing a tall um, converted Georgian ha house. So it's converted into apartments and um, we've got a family on the top floor. It's Steph, Paul and their teenage daughter Freya. Um, on the middle floor we've got Emma who lives alone. She's going through a bit of a tough time so she watches people coming and going from the building um, and she's quite kind of envious I suppose of the family that lives upstairs as well and, and what she perceives about their life um, and then on the bottom floor in the basement flat we've got um, Chris and his wife Vicky and Chris is the local driving instructor so he teaches a lot of the local teenagers to drive and he he sort of drives around the neighborhood making observations but he feels kind of a bit of an outsider for reasons which um, are explored in the book. Mm. Um, so they're all kind of aware of each other. They live under the same roof as, you know, a lot of people are familiar with that scenario as we were just talking about. Um, but their lives really collide when Freya from the top floor goes missing um, and they're all drawn into the search for her. Um, and they all kind of uh, project different things onto her disappearance and make different assumptions about it. And Steph and Paul, of course, uh, start to look at the people around them differently um, and start to um, wonder how much they know about their neighbours and also about each other. Um, and all their lives and kind of things that they've been keeping hidden perhaps start to unravel from there. So I won't give too much more away. Ooh, intriguing. And we are here for it. I can't wait to get into all the dirty details. But first, I just want to pause and welcome everyone on Facebook. Welcome, Jenny. Welcome, Gail. Gail says, happy Fat Tuesday. Welcome. She's one of our top community members. Welcome, Joanne. Welcome, Joy. Welcome, Helen. Welcome, Claire. Welcome, Nasreen. And especially welcome and thank you to my partner in crime, pun intended, Kimberly Hensel Lawrence. And she's one of our Mighty Blaze team members here, fellow writer. Um, and she is helping produce this event over on Facebook. So thank you so much, Kimberly. Now, if you've been here before, you know how this works. And if you're new, welcome. We're so thrilled you're here and here's how it works mighty mysteries is a show every tuesday to celebrate our favorite genre mystery and thrillers and suspense and i present you our featured author and you get to ask them anything so here's your chance to ask helen anything you'd like about her book about her writing anything that's weighing on your mind within reason and <laughs> i will get those questions right over to her so let's go ahead and start typing those comments into the chat and i'll get them right over to helen meanwhile i've got to share a few words of praise because you guys this book is blowing up so library journal awarded <coughs> helen a starred review wow raving fans of british mysteries will love this debut it is difficult to put down this is one that readers may not figure out fully if at all in advance of the denouement but the author ties all the secrets together in a most satisfying reveal yum i am here for it <laughs> Kent Country Living says, this is perfect for fans of twisty plots that keep you guessing, my favorite. Publishers <laughs> Weekly says, it is a heart-pounding debut. Even avid suspense readers won't be able to predict all of the twists. Cooper is off to a strong start. Wow, Helen, this is incredible. <laughs> Booklist saying Cooper skillfully builds a house of cards, demolishes it, reshuffles the deck, deals an even stronger hand while keeping a few cards up her sleeve. An emotionally charged domestic suspense debut, perfect for fans of Lucy Foley and Lu Ruth Ware. Ruth, of course, has been on the show and is coming back in May. Lucy Foley, fantastic, mm -hmm. loved her book, The Guest List. I could go on and on. You're getting tons of hearts from the group. Anissa Joy <laughs> giving you tons of hearts. One of our top community members as well. So much hearts and hands up from everybody. Welcome, Shirley. 
Um, so let's talk about how you did it, Helen. How did you write a book that uh, reshuffles the deck, deals an even stronger hand? How'd you keep a few cards up your sleeve? Walk us through that process. Uh, with difficulty, um, there were times when I despaired of the tasks that I'd set for myself because <laughs> there were <laughs> so many characters and, and plot lines and kind of twists and things to keep hidden and things to reveal. But that was why it was such a joy to write, really. And that's why it's just so brilliant when I get that feedback that people didn't guess the twist or were shocked by the twist or mm. um, thought something was going on when it was actually something else. And also that they were satisfied when it all came together at the end, because that's that's really the hardest bit. Um, yeah. but in terms of how I did it, um, I mean, I did quite a lot of planning and um, the initial idea really was that um, image that uh, we get in the first chapter where there's Emma under the stairs she overhears something from the flat above um, and um, it's that idea that you know you do overhear bits and bobs from your neighbor's life but what if you heard something that really made you stop in your tracks, something a bit unusual, mm. something that piqued your interest, or maybe even something that gave you the wrong impression. Um, so that was the initial spark. Um, and then I had loads of different ideas already scribbled in my notebook um, that I wanted to bring in. So I think the fact that I could create this sort of cast of characters all living in the same neighborhood meant that I could bring in lots of different ideas that I'd already had stewing in the back of my head. Um, so the character of the driving instructor, for example, um, and the storyline with Paul was something I'd already um, been thinking about in terms of a book. Um, so I guess the task was just weaving it all together, really, um, which took me quite a bit of time and lots of post-it notes, shuffling them around. So that thing about reshuffling the deck is, you know, is quite accurate, really. Um, I had lots and, you know, different things that I wanted to happen and different storylines written down. And I did literally sort of shuffle them around and then try to get them into some kind of structure that would make sense and be satisfying um, and then thinking sort of plotting it out when the different reveals were going to happen for the different characters um, but there was loads of editing as well loads of feedback from lots and lots of different readers from my editor from my agent so that really really helped as well with shaping the book. Mm. I love the sneak peek behind the scenes. Thank you so much. I want to talk more about that, but I also want to start getting into questions. So Kimberly would like to know, did you consider splitting the story up into a series? She said, I don't read a lot of mystery books. I prefer single books, but I know a lot of people who enjoy mystery series and the ongoing tensions that can be present throughout of the books. Yeah. Walk us through that. Are you planning a series? Tell us. <laughs> I'm not, and I never thought about doing a series at all. And um, mm. I don't really know why. I wouldn't necessarily rule it out, but I don't read a lot of series. I'm a bit like Kimberly. I prefer standalone books um, and then to meet a different sort of cast of characters in the next book. And I think I'm the same with writing. I think each time I like to create the characters and create a new situation and a new um, environment and new settings so I think um, that's maybe why writing a series isn't for me mm. but as I said I wouldn't rule it out because it would be interesting I think to keep following a set of characters or a character through lots and lots of books certainly very cool now how long did it take you to write this book start to finish soup to nuts <laughs> um, I can't actually remember um, mm. I was thinking about this earlier because I thought you might ask me, um, but I think too, I think writing the actual writing the book to start with took about a year or a year and a half, I think, mm -hmm. and I was writing it mainly on the train to work, so it was on my daily commute, uh, lunch hours, and obviously weekends when I could. Um, but then there was a lot, uh, there was maybe another six months at least um, of editing it with my agent and kind of getting her feedback and making some tweaks. And again, because it is quite a complex plot, the editing um, and getting it really right and getting all the sort of twists and reveals to land properly did take quite a long time. So it's probably about two years in total, maybe even slightly longer. Mm. 
very good. Well, it is a tight two years because look at this amazing praise you've gotten. This is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Now, one thing I think is really fascinating in the book is this idea of neighbors. I live in an apartment building. I've always lived in an apartment buildings. Um, I want to know from the audience, how many of you have ever wondered about your neighbors? Hands up in the comments. Come on now. <laughs> this is a mighty mystery. And what happens on here stays on here. But tell us, I mean, we all have caught, all of us who have lived in apartment buildings have overheard little snippets of conversations or the occasional disagreement. Um, and and it, that's just a part of, of, of living in a building. And so what I love that you have done here is you've taken something that is so universal to all of us who have you know lived in a in a in a, in a flat as they would say in England um you know and and taken that idea and then blown it up in the most delicious way so audience tell me what you're thinking have you ever heard anything uh tasty and delicious from your neighbors <laughs> Um, oh, definitely want to know. <laughs> we all want to know. Kim Kim said she just ordered this book. Yay, Kim, come back and tell us what you think. <laughs> Welcome. You. She says, thank you. Welcome, Philippa. Welcome, Elisa. Anissa Joy would like to know, with all of the twists and turns, are you an extreme plotter? Yes, yeah, so walk us through that in a little more detail. Do you, you know, do you put it all up on your wall? Do you, are you ever surprised by your characters? Tell us, tell us that. Sure. Um, I think I am. I'm not, I wouldn't say an, I'm an extreme plotter. I'm not one of those with spreadsheets and stuff like that. I kind of wish I was because it might be a bit more straightforward. <laughs> um, but I think I do. I mean, I make, make a lot of notes, um, but I, I tend to sketch out the, out the overall outline to start with. So I know roughly where I'm going. Um, but then I'm always quite impatient to get started on the writing and um, so I'll write a few chapters and then I'll probably pause and plot a little bit more mm. and then write a few more chapters, pause, plot a bit more. So I'm kind of always plotting a few chapters ahead, but with an idea where I'm going overall and where we're going to end up. Um, but definitely my characters surprise me and so many things about this book have changed along the way. Um, I don't think I can even remember fully what the original very, very first draft would have looked like because I did make a lot of changes along the way um, and tweak things as I went. And maybe if I'd been an extreme plotter, I wouldn't have had to do that, but I think that's part of the fun. <laughs> Oh, cool. Okay. Thank you for that inside glance, a glimpse behind the curtain. Thank you, Anissa, for that great question. Lisa, thanks for your hands up. Me too, girl. Um, uh, Jenny would like to know, are your characters based on real experiences at all? People in your life where you have known, ooh, we need to know. <laughs> Helen, tell us. Should I answer that? <laughs> um, they're not really, I don't think. Um, I think little things creep in. Um, like the hamster, for example, he is based on a hamster that I had when I was little. So he is based on a real character. <laughs> um, and he's quite integral because he is the reason that Emma goes into the cupboard that night and overhears the neighbours because she's feeding him. Um, so he is based on a real character. And then I, I think little bits creep in here and there um, of other things. So maybe... Um, Kate with her love of English and reading and stories of course that kind of comes from me and from people I know and then there's uh, Paul and Freya are quite sporty with their running quite competitive so I think elements creep in from people you know but none of the characters are fully based on anybody that I know. Um, but I think Helen this, this says no creep. one wink <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's my story and I'm sticking to it <laughs> in case anyone's watching yeah um, absolutely <laughs> I'm, gonna just, <laughs> I'm gonna warn everyone I write nonfiction, so be nice to me yeah um, absolutely. now Helen one thing that I I was very intrigued and really really resonated with me is that you write a lot about um, the relationships between different women. And that is something that is fascinating to me as a woman and also as an observer of women, we're complicated. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, I think that was something that really came to the fore as I was writing it, because I don't think I set out to write about that, but um, I think the women and the relationships between them really started to play more and more important role as the book went on um, and as the writing went on um, and I'd start to notice and, and this was something my editor really 
picked up on and wanted to draw out even further as well um, when she bought the book was the different types of female relationship that are in there. There's cousins, obviously the relationship between Kate and her cousin is really central. There's quite a few mothers and daughters and different kind of types of um, mother-daughter relationships. Um, and then there's the friendship that develops sort of between um, Emma and Steph, the neighbors, which perhaps wouldn't have developed if it hadn't been for Freya's disappearance. So there's mm. kind of friendships or sort of slightly uneasy friendships that are forged just because of the crisis that they find themselves in. Um, and also I think without me really intending it, um, Emma and Steph who live in the same building um, and are quite different women in a way and, and live quite different lives, they started to sort of mirror each other more and more as the book went on as well. Um, and again, that was something in the later edits that I really drew out and played on a little bit more, the way that these women, they think they're quite different and then they're sort of thrown together by this uh, crisis that happens to one of them and the mm. fact that they live so close to each other. Um, and then they start to realize there's a lot more similarities between them than they first thought. Um, but there's also this thing about should they trust one another? They Again, they really don't know each other that well. And, and there's a lot at stake by sort of by the time that they, they start to become friends as well. Mm. So yeah, it really was something that I enjoyed developing, even if I didn't exactly set out to, to you know, particularly write about that. Oh, I love that. Helen, thank you again for this very cool glimpse behind the curtain. Um, I want to get over to Sully's question now. Um, how do you balance giving enough clues to make it possible for readers to figure out the mystery, but not making it too easy? This is from Steve. Oh mm -hmm. my God, Steve, you are, this is the heart of what I wrestle with every single day. <laughs> Helen, enlighten us. I'm asking uh, for a friend. I kind of wish I could. Um, it is really, really hard. I think that's one of the hardest things. Um, totally agree. Um, and I think one thing, I think, the key partly to that is getting that feedback. So getting early readers who will actually tell you, I guessed this, I didn't guess this, I thought this, because you're so up close to it. You don't, you know what you're intending to do, but you don't really know what people will be thinking or guessing or assuming as they're reading it. So you mm. need that feedback. Um, um, and then you can kind of make little tweaks and stuff. Um, but I always remember this piece of advice. It, it was at a um, writing workshop that I went to. I've, I've honestly been to every writing workshop going. I've read every book. I've just like lap it all up. Um, and at one of them I went to, um, she said, you know, you make a noise with one hand and while you're feeding clues with the other hand or something like that. Um, but it's about kind of causing a distraction. So the readers know something's going on and they think one thing, but actually you're feeding the clues in in a slightly different way to what they think, if that makes sense. Um, so they see that the clue's there, but they make the wrong assumption about the clue. Um, so that later on down the line, they don't feel cheated because they realize the clue was there. It's just that they kind of uh, linked it to slightly the wrong thing or the wrong part of the plot if that makes sense. That makes so much sense. And thank you for that because I, I, that you explained it in a way that I can, that I, that my brain can immediately grasp. And clearly you, Helen Cooper have done this and done it so well. Again, earning a starred review from a library journal, um, is, you know, pointing out that, that readers may not figure out fully, if at all, in advance of the denouement. So you have mastered that thing, which is hardest to do. Again, um, Steve, thank you for that great question. You know, again, book list, raving that you are able to, uh, uh, marveling at your ability to do that, because I think that is so hard. And I actually recently watched that um, new Agatha Christie um show on uh, on Netflix about the for the the Agatha Christie disappeared for 10 days in real life and it has never been figured out where she was or what she did during those 10 days and so this <laughs> this this uh Netflix short series takes a gander at what that could have been and in it she you know there's a scene where she shares you know she's she she's she's in this uh, Netflix series she's 
she goes undercover and basically she starts asking people what what they think of Agatha Christie books and people said well I started to guess guess them on page two and she's just devastated and she's you know <laughs> trying to figure out how to do this and it's something that every mystery writer wrestles with you don't oh, want to give it away on page two but you don't want people yeah. to feel tricked or angry no, on page exactly. 300 like frustrated yeah yeah so clearly you have done it so well um so thank you so much um uh, Kimberly is reminding me that Emma Rouse uh, raved about this book saying, lock your doors, close your curtains and sink <laughs> into this claustrophobic tale of families, neighbors and buried secrets, tense and perfectly paced. This emotionally charged novel will keep you guessing right to the very end. Again, amazing, amazing praise. I um, as well. <laughs> Yay. So Helen, let me ask you, what is your favorite scene from this book? No spoilers, but what's your favorite scene and why? Um, well, actually, I think to describe my favorite scene would be a bit of a spoiler. So I'm going to kind of dance around it. Um, Tell us because, where in the book it is. Is it toward the end? Or, so we know uh, when we get there. I would say it's about two thirds of the way through. Um, because I think my favorite scenes or my favorite bits, I think, are the reveals, or a lot of them are the reveals, because I think that's, those bits are the reward for the reader, but they're also kind of the reward for the writer um, when you get to them and when you get to write them, because you've been, as I said, feeding in those clues all the way and just trying to tread that line. And then finally, you get to actually reveal something and something meaty and tell the reader what actually you've been leading up to all along so when I'm writing them I'm kind of like you know and I really get into them um, and it's hard because you have to if you built it up that much you have to try not to disappoint the reader with the final reveal as well um, but I think that's why uh, I put a lot into a couple of the, the sort of big reveal scenes um, so I suppose they're kind of my favorites um, but there's little scenes as well along the way. A lot of the scenes with Kate and her mum in their kitchen are really liked and scenes with Becca and Kate. So again, just those sort of family life scenes as well that um, sort of prop up the story along the way. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Um, welcome, Galenda. Welcome, David. Welcome, everyone who's watching. Um, Anissa is saying she also watched the um, the mystery of where Mrs. Christie was mm -hmm. for those 11 days that no one actually knows where she was. Anissa, you're so right. And I loved that show. Um, mm -hmm. Welcome, Sarah. Um, Helen, Tell us your writing. Walk us through a day in the life of your writing. Um, do you do you or do you rise with the sun? Do you flow <laughs> effortlessly to your desk? Do the words pour out of you? Are you are you anyway? Are you clawing your word paint, way word for word through a desert? I mean, what's it look like? Um, neither quite of those extremes, <laughs> but <laughs> somewhere in between, I think. I do get up early um, because I'm much better in the morning. I'm terrible at night. I just can't do anything. I kind of, um, I love the idea of, of sort of staying up all night and, and, you know, writing all night kind of thing until the sunrise, but I just could not do it. I have to be in bed at like half nine. Um, so I get up early um, and I usually start writing um, just after breakfast um, in the morning. And then I'll probably write till about mid morning and then have a break or maybe go for a run. Um, and uh, and then just carry on until I run out of steam, really. I mean, this is on a good day. Obviously, sometimes there's distractions and, and things. Um, but yeah, I usually, so I usually start about half past seven in the morning, something like that, sometimes earlier, because I do love those early mornings and it's nice and quiet in the house as well. Um, mm. And then right till probably about three, four o'clock, something like that, when I run out of steam. And then a few breaks along the way. It okay. kind of depends, I guess, how well it's all flowing and how tired I'm feeling and all that kind of thing. But it is different to before when I was just writing in sort of little blocks of time um, on the train and in lunch hours. So it is quite different. And sometimes there's that pressure to kind of think, oh, I've got the whole day. I've got to get so-and-so words done. And you end up actually being less productive. But, but usually, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. 
Very cool. And actually, um, Jeffrey Deaver, who just was um, anointed a mystery master by the MWA, the Mystery Writers Association, um, he actually started writing his books on the on the train to and from work in New York back in his days as, as a lawyer. So apparently there's something to this train writing, to this commute writing. About it, I, think. I think it's because it's sort of the same time every day, your brain almost gets used to like this is my hour of kind of writing being in that zone kind of time and I used to walk to the station as well which was about half an hour so I'd be thinking about the writing as I was walking and then as soon as I got on the train I'd know what I wanted to write and it would all kind of come out um, and I, it was, I was lucky that I always got a seat um, usually anyway on the way back not so much and <laughs> on the way back you're, you're balancing your yeah. laptop on one hand <laughs> yeah, okay. But taking, yeah, I used to love riding on the train. Taking the train to New York, which is three and a half to four hours from Boston, is some of my favorite time to write on the Amtrak train. You know, the yeah. and you can just sort of recline and write. I love yeah. it. And you're, do not you know, do, you're not feeling pressured to do anything else, I think. Exactly. It's just that or staring out the window, which is also extremely enjoyable. Yeah. Helen, do you have any weird writing rituals? I mean, I've heard everything from, I listen to ABBA to people stream the sound of coffee shops because none of us can go to coffee shops now during the pandemic. Do you have any, do you have any, show us your weird. Uh, um, I don't think I do really. No, hmm. I don't listen to anything. I have silence. I do like to have things around me. So I've got like little postcards that have got quotes about writing on and stuff like that. Um, and I've got photos, obviously, and books. So I don't think I could write a, like a completely clean, tidy desk. I have to have my little sort of knickknacks and stuff. Um, but apart from that, I don't think I've got any weird rituals. <laughs> Except from listening to your neighbors with a, with a cup against oh, the yeah, door. Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, absolutely. That, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, writing it all down. <laughs> right, exactly. so you, you knock, yeah. you say, speak you up. <laughs> I, can't, I can't hear you. They're going to be avoiding me now that the book's come out. One time I was having an argument with my husband and I thought, oh my God, the neighbors can hear me. So I found myself starting to explain my side loudly to them, you know, yeah. like ordinarily I would just be like, you're a jerk, but I would yeah. be like, you're a jerk because you did well, not do reasons. the dishes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wanted That's them to be on my best. side. <laughs> You know, I got it. They, there's, there, there is sides and I want them on mine. So I, I found <laughs> yeah, myself definitely. playing to the peanut gallery. <laughs> um, we have just three minutes left with Helen. So we're in the lightning round. Any last questions? Ooh, they're coming in. Gabby would like to know, did you consider how many people are staying in their apartments more because of quarantine while writing a book that makes the reader really start to question who their neighbors are? Oh my God, Gabby, <laughs> yes. Helen, yeah. tell us, everyone's home I'm during in- the pandemic. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, I wrote it way before the pandemic, but I've certainly been thinking about it more since. And since the book came out, that is something that I think we're all, I think, much more or even more aware of our neighbours um, now because we're all at home all the time. Um, and I have had loads of people telling me about, you know, things they've seen, comings and goings, <laughs> things they've heard, which is great. I love hearing it all. Um, so yeah, definitely, it seems even more apt um, at the moment. Absolutely. The other day, I was walking my dog, and I heard someone. Yeah, I was walking my dog down the the street, and I heard someone with their window open exercising, and they were shouting encouragements at themselves, like <laughs> "You're looking strong. You're looking great." And I thought, man, I should really, I should encourage myself more. So now I am. I'm like, really? "You're looking strong. Yeah. You're looking." Great. <laughs> you just never know what you're what you're going to hear. Um, thank you for that. Any final questions for Gabby? Um, best writing advice, advice you'd like to pass on? Um, I would say read a lot, um, read, read, read. Um, and while you're reading, obviously enjoy the book, um, but think about why you're enjoying it. Um, Mm. And I do this obsessively now that I'm reading. I can't just read and think, what is the writer doing to keep me engaged and keep me interested? Why do I love this book so much? Mm. And then try to kind of bring some of that to your own writing. Um, So read a lot, get a lot of feedback on your work, I would say. Um, It's really scary, but it's really, really, really helpful if you want to 
improve so get people to read it and tell you you know what they thought and felt as they were reading it um, I think they're the main main two bits and then just keep going keep practicing um, keep persevering it takes you know years and years and a lot of hard work and practice absolutely um, question do you tell us about the title of your book was this the first one yes Helen, can you, and can you hold it up and tell us the title of the, actually about the cover as well, the title and the cover. Um, so, yep, yeah, this is The Downstairs Neighbor. Um, it absolutely was not the first title. I've been through so many, <laughs> you wouldn't believe. Um, so I think the title, the final title came into being um, when, when the sort of neighbor theme became stronger. So it wasn't always the, the main theme, although it was a key part and although it was the first image I started with, um, there was you know, a lot of um, themes around how well we know our parents, how well we know our children, um, our spouses, and all of that is still in there. Um, but there's also obviously a lot about neighbours and people around you. Um, so it's been through loads and loads of titles, really. Um, I do find titles hard, um, but this is the one that we finally kind of agreed upon. And I, I love it now. I do think it really kind of captures um, a lot about the book. And there's well, you'll know if you read it, there's a lot of characters in it that actually could be the downstairs neighbor that's being referred to in the title because there isn't actually just, just one. Um, so I quite like that as well. I like the way that lots of different things link back to the title that we eventually went for.